Hi everyone. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Contran and I am the secretary of the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Employee Resource Group at HUD. I'm very grateful for HUD's leadership in supporting May Heritage Month. The, um, the Asian American story is part of the American story and our narratives deserve to be told. As for me, growing up Vietnamese, I remember my father waking up at dawn and making banh mi Vietnamese baguette for lunch. Every morning, he would drive me to school and he would delay his lunch hour so that he can pick me up so that I didn't have to walk home in the Phoenix heat. Sometimes he would work overtime but he would always call to check if I was doing my homework. And if I got done early, IHOP was actually on the menu because where else are you going to get unlimited pancakes 24 hours a day? That was a pretty good deal for me. <laughs> so that work ethics and dedication have been with me through all these years. Story like mine are not uncommon, but they're worth telling because they're part of the Asian American experience. AA and NHPI is a community of communities. So we must proactively share our diverse experiences and skill set to build the American story. Thank you so much for your partnership in this important initiative. And we have a great program for you today. Now, I would like to introduce uh, Pamela Zai, the president of our employee resource group. Thanks, Khan. Hi, uh, good morning uh, from Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, my name is Pam Zai. I am the president of the HUD ANHPI employee resource group. I'm in the Office of Fair Housing as lead off equal opportunity specialist. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, to celebrate May Heritage Month. Um, I have the honor of introducing um, uh, one of our speakers, uh, Mr. Vinay Singh. He is our CFO and our chief AI officer. Um, he joins HUD. We uh, have him from a small business administration. Um, he's had a long story history um, in working in communities and with uh, creating partnerships and forging new alliances and looking for innovations. Uh, he used to be the deputy assistant secretary at the International Trade Association, which is how uh, he started learning about uh, the importance of, and foundation of small communities. Let me, I'm proud to introduce Mr. Vinay Singh. Thank you so much. Apologies. Uh, thank you for your patience in only hearing me hopefully uh, significant technology challenges today. Uh, but I'm honored to speak with all of you, work with uh, many of you uh, along this amazing journey. It's a privilege and an honor to work for this administration, to work alongside the fierce uh, leadership uh, led by Acting Secretary Todman and so many others, and so many just great people. I think, you know, I will start by saying, I'll share a little bit, you know, our theme is bridging histories and shaping futures. Uh, I'll tell you, I immigrated as a, a early teenager to America and I'll share my journey. But what I found and take away from that experience of York, Pennsylvania, or a smaller town within York, Dover, Pennsylvania, small towns are really what uh, America's about and what makes it great. In fact, I've lived in many cities around the world, uh, largely an urban downtown person, but recently moved back to York so that my young daughter could have the same experience um, that, that I had and my, my wife also had in rural Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, I was born in Bangalore, um, India. Um, my, my parents left for Germany and I was raised by my grandparents for a few years. I remember so many stories, uh, especially this weekend was my father's 80th that I got to celebrate in Northern Virginia. So it's kind of top of mind, um, this discussion and just kind of jogged a lot of memories. But, you know, things like watching my grandmother um, you know, churn out buttermilk and butter and the meals that we would have and just how 
difficult things were and the process was so drawn out. But then at the end of it, it was that community meal. Um, but, you know, from that experience, then moving to Germany, so spent several years there, uh, to Canada, and then to America, you know, English being my third language, this journey has taught me a lot, and I know many of you share, in just witnessing the sacrifice that's made by our parents, our grandparents, and even those that are just part of a small community that, you know, when my parents moved to Germany, literally the way I got to Germany from India is within a few weeks, they met another Indian family from a different part of the country uh, in India. Um, within a few weeks, they were best friends and literally put me on a plane uh, with them. I've never met them. Uh, I think in today's world, it probably is illegal. I don't know what the rules are, but that just goes to show you the bonds that were made for folks, for immigrants traveling around the world you know, on the journey to America and the different journeys we all take, you know, really kind of, uh, you know, makes me just feel honored to be uh, working alongside folks, being in public service. Um, but that journey also where public service for me is important um, comes from my, uh, few of my relatives, my grandfather directly worked for the administration in Bangor in Karnataka, where the banner on the building that still holds behind us is government work is God's work. Uh, this is not a religious statement. I just feel that it, it, it's so important to communities. That's resonated with me. Several members of my family were in the military. Uh, my mother um, got her degree later as she sacrificed so much, but she, it was a, it was a proud moment uh, about 15, 17 years ago to watch her get her bachelor's degree and go into working with children in communities. Um, and, um, Sorry, we lost her a few years ago. So, but, you know, seeing all these sacrifices and when, where we are today, um, you know, the histories, the communities, not just in Asian Americans, not just in Indians, but in my colleges, in the places I've lived, and what I'm even teaching my young daughter, and we travel extensively, and by just opening your hearts, opening, you know, having this kind of journey, shared journey, you, you engage easier in conversations uh, if you're able to travel uh, because of the tolerance, right? That any goal is to be tolerant, to be kind. And I think the folks I work with here, I mentioned Acting Secretary Todd, and I mean, I, I do her as like a mentor, but even her empathetic leadership has really weighed on me in this whole journey. Um, and being back in the small town, I mean, local is global, right? And so the vision for the future I see with these continued intercultural connections within this community and beyond is continuing to learn from each other's histories. You know, we're in local communities that we can foster those impacts. Um, and then, you know, we have the global engagement. But public service is really critical, I, I think, in the sense that these are shared values we have, uh, and it's for a shared impact. And I really want to thank all of you for your service. I mean, I, you know, we're part of uh, so many of us, from families um, that were witnessing revolution or turmoil in this whole journey, so our journeys, or even some of you in the current journeys. But I'm hopeful that let's continue our journey together uh, making it an evolution rather than a revolution. Uh, I'm, uh, so thank you, and I hope you have a great session today, and thanks for letting me be a small part of it. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. Um, let's give him another round of applause. Yeah. We're especially grateful for Renee because he said yes to our invitation um, just last week. And then he said yes before we even had the how figured it out. I think as a community, we went through so much to get where we are today. He truly exemplifies the, the spirit of action and the community we cherish, especially today during the IT you know, the, um, uh, difficulty. Um, well... Happy AANHPI Heritage Month, everybody. My name is Ming Huo. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, HQ representative of the AANHPI Employee Resource Group. Um, our next amazing speaker, uh, I had a pleasure working with her. And when I say amazing, I truly mean it. She um, truly embodies the essence of uh, dedication to justice and diversity. From her tenure as the Director of Equity um, for the Office of Field Policy and Management to her more than two decades of service in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, 
She has fought tirelessly against the housing discrimination and advocated for those who need the most. Without further ado, please join me welcoming our HUD Chief Diversity Officer, Kimberly Nevels. Thank you, Mean. And she said, amazing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation and I am so happy that I could join y'all in person. Um, so this month we celebrate the contributions of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders to American history, culture and society. I love this year's theme. I am a history major, I'm a history nerd. So the theme is bridging histories and shaping our futures. Um, one of the first things I did was look up and see why May? Why was May chosen? So May was chosen to commemorate the arrival of the first Japanese immigrant to the US on May 7th in 1843, as well as the anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in May of 1869. I love history. We got to go all the way back, right? Um, but the story of the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities is a story of diversity, right? These are, as was said, communities of communities, right? And so Vice President Harris stated that our unity is our strength and our diversity is our power. And so I love history, spent many years in civil rights, so that's where I tend to always go. So many early Asian American activists got their start in the civil rights movement. One such activist was Yuri Kochiyama. She was a Japanese American civil rights activist who championed the social justice movements in the black, Latino, Native American, and Asian American communities. She stated that she wanted her legacy to, the legacy she wanted to leave is that people try to build bridges and not walls. So I'm gonna leave you with that statement as we build bridges together. Thank you again. Well, wow, let's give another round of applause to King. It's an absolute pleasure to have King with us today. Next, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, who is also my role model at heart, Tony Nui. Well, Tony joined HUD as a chief performance officer, a career senior executive position in 2021. Uh, well, I'm not going to list a long, amazing bio of Tony, you know, serving the federal government for more than 20 years. But I think today, Tony's story is not just about his remarkable career at the federal service, but also about the family, perseverance, and uh, quintessential American dream. I had the honor learning about Tony's story while planning this event. Let me tell you, the story really resonates every fiber of American spirit. And um, from the begin humble beginnings to the policy making at the highest level, Tony's journey along with his incredible wife and children really epitomizes the resilience and the dedication that defines American experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming HUD Chief Performance Officer, Nian Tony Lui. I can't top that, man, come back. I can't, I can't, that's it. I can't do any better than that. <laughs> Uh, thanks so much for uh, spending this time together today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, uh, Pam. Xin uh, um, uh, What I've prepared today, uh, some of these uh, uh, I'll, I'll read just kind of in, in deference to um, experiences that have been shared with me, and uh, some I'll just kind of speak from, from the heart a little bit. 
Um, so what I'd like to share today is just a, a, a few themes that, that we'll tie together at the end. And we have a special treat, as um, you can see from the, the instruments on the stage. But I would first like to start with friendship. And I'll start with the following story. A graduate of West Point, Brigadier General Wallace L. Clement served in three wars, World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam, participating in nine campaigns. His decorations included the Distinguished Service Cross, Distinguished Service Medal, Silver Star, Three Legions of Merit, Bronze Star for Valor, as well as Italian and Vietnamese government decorations. In Vietnam, he served as Assistant Division Commander of the 23rd Infantry Division, also known as the Americal Division, and then later as Director of Training for South Vietnamese Army Forces. Clement passed away at the age of 86 on June 11th of 2000, and he, of course, he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Being a highly decorated Army officer and veteran of three wars isn't Clement's highest accomplishment. That is because Clement's story isn't just about his military service. Part of Clement's living legacy continues through a Vietnamese American family that would not be where it is today without his friendship and decency. While stationed in Saigon, Clement met a young man while he was out jogging. The man's name was Nguyen Nhat Tan. Tung was sitting on his front porch playing the guitar when Clement, who was jogging out of uniform, just stopped to talk to him, not realizing that he was talking with a U.S. Army flag officer. Tung became friends with Clement through their love of music. A few weeks after their initial meeting, Clement returned to the house in uniform and met Tung's older brother, Tang, who worked for navigation engineering for the Vietnamese Directorate of Civil Aviation. Tang, the older brother, was shocked. He looked at his younger brother and said, how do you know General Clement? Undaunted, Tung, the young guitarist, laughed it off and promised Clement that he would take him to the clubs where the two would then sing together. Eventually, Clement ended his tour in 1970 and returned to his home in Fairfax, but he kept in touch with the two brothers. He even made dog tags for each family member with his own name and home address on them so they could find him in the United States. And it was this special bond that would later help the Nguyen's to su survive and flourish after their escape from Vietnam, after the fall of Saigon in 1975. Right before Vietnam fell to northern aggression, the older brother, Kang, was granted asylum due to his service to the Civil Aviation Directorate. He was able to escape with his family on a plane that would land in Guam. He was able to bring his wife, their three children, his, his younger brother, uh, Thung, and their youngest sister, Kim Kue, who was 16 years old, and the 18-month-old son of another sister, Kim Mai. Meanwhile, back in the States, General Clement attempted to use his contacts to get the family out, but they were unable to locate the family and did not know their whereabouts, until Tang's older brother, Tang, of course, using those dog tags, found uh, General Clement, and he reached him from Guam. Six weeks later, under Clement's sponsorship, the Nguyen's arrived in Fairfax to begin their new life in the United States. During this time, Kim Kwe cared for her nephew until her sister, the boy's mother, was able to come to Virginia to pick him up. Kim Kwe's sister is my mother, Kim Mai, and nearly 50 years later, that boy's journey places him before you today. I also love the theme uh, of this year's um, Heritage Month, a uh, celebration of A and HPI, bridging histories and shaping our futures. So much of our histories are intertwined and interconnected. I'll share now the story of two young parents and their growing family in the words of my mother, Nguyen Thi Kim Mai. My husband and I were married in January of 1973, and we welcomed the son, Tony, in September of that year. Several weeks before the fall of Saigon on April 30th, 1975, which is the capital city of South Vietnam, my brother Tang gave us a special blessing by offering to bring our son Tony, only 18 months old at the time with him, to America. Mm. 
<laughs> my husband and I felt thankful, but very sad in our hearts because we may never, I'm sorry, I didn't expect it to hit this soon. <laughs> um, my husband and I felt thankful, but very sad in our hearts because we may never see our son again. We had 24 hours to make this decision. We'd already been warned by a relative who was a communist that the new communist government, which we all knew would be coming, had already named us on the kill list because they believed we were selling babies rather than saving them through adoption because we both worked for the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, an American adoption agency. There was no way out for us. We could not afford to pay for a boat trip to escape the coming communists. As we let our son go with my brother, our boss from the adoption agency, he also said goodbye to all the employees and he flew back to America. I was crying and crying, but my husband said that it was the best choice. If we died, then at least our son would be taken care of. My husband and I went to church and prayed every day that our lives would be saved. This all happened so fast. Somehow, within days of letting our son go, a new American boss from the adoption agency arrived from Taiwan. We were shocked when he asked all the employees to fly with him to America with 24 adopted babies and young children who had already had adoptive parents in America. These babies needed care for the flight and the journey over to America. And so my parents were able to to support that. It's ironic that at that time, the, the forces of, of the war, one side was gonna kill my parents for taking care of babies and the other side was able to save my parents because they were taking care of babies. What a miracle. We never dreamed it could happen this way in our lives. During the flight to America, my husband, who was a pediatrics intern, held a dying baby in his arms and kept him alive until he could be brought to a hospital in Guam. After a short stay in Guam in a refugee camp, we arrived in San Francisco. Then all the adoption agency employees flew to Philadelphia because the agency's headquarters was in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Facing our new life in America without knowing the whereabouts of our son and my brother's family was a very painful experience. In addition to the emotional pain, we faced new challenges related to learning a new language and new cultures. Luckily, the people of our sponsoring church, St. David's Episcopal Church in Wayne, Pennsylvania, were very kind, and they tried their best to help us adjust to refugee life in America. More than a month passed, then the Red Cross found my brother's family at Camp Pendleton in California. We just... We just couldn't stop crying with our tears of joy. Finally, we reunited in Virginia and we held our son, Tony. My brother's family and my sister were determined and worked successfully to rebuild their own lives in Virginia with the tremendous help of an American friend, General Wells Clement. My husband and I decided to stay in Pennsylvania because of the special program that helped Vietnamese doctors rebuild their careers in America. My husband became a psychiatrist, and I became a social worker. It is hard to believe that time has flown by so fast and how much our family has grown, but we have been in America for 49 years. In addition to uh, being a physician, my, my father is actually a poet as well. In fact, it was his poetry uh, that caught the eye of a medical director who then offered him a job where he um, still practices medicine 42 years. Um, I was asking, how many folks do you think you've, you've, how many patients do you think you've treated? You see, he's very quick with his numbers and his math. And he said, I think I've had probably 200,000 uh, visits, maybe about 50,000 patients. I assure you that I too have saved countless lives by realizing I had no business in medicine. So here I am before you today as well. But I would like to share a poem that he wrote. It was actually in 2015, commemorating the 40-year anniversary of the Vietnamese refugee boat people. And it's titled, Vietnamese Refugee Boat People, 40 Years Later. This poem is dedicated to the many thousands of boat people who perished by the sea. 
As soon as I woke up this morning, I felt overwhelmed by memories of long ago past. Many years of war tore my country apart. A million people left their relatives and their country, Vietnam. After losing the war, many people escaped for their lives with their possessions in their handbags or knapsacks. They left everything behind hoping to be alive. They were willing to sacrifice for their future lives. They left their homes in rain or shine. Mountain passes or deep rivers couldn't stop their determination. Their eyes embraced their native country for the last time. The Pacific Ocean was waiting for them. They prayed to reach the other shore alive. But the other shore of the Pacific was very far away. A few thousand people trampled and rushed to board the cargo ship, Jung Sun, for a life of freedom. At Saigon's river port on the day that South Vietnam turned red, those lucky departed suffered a great deal. Those who remained behind suffered a hundred times more. Those who tried to escape followed in their step and other steps. In the dark of the night, they moved around like ghosts. The sound of a dog barking could bring disaster. A sudden whistle or gunshot could bring an end to one's life. People escaped from Central, South, and North Vietnam. Boat people tragedies recorded forever in human history. My daughter-in-law succeeded after 13 attempts. Many people died in their search of freedom. For many, many years, people tried to escape by the sea. Their fate was like a bell being hung by a thread. Big waves tossed small fishing boats like tiny leaves. Many boats broke apart and people sank to the ocean floor. Tens of thousands of boats departed, but how many arrived? Because of their overloads, many boats were capsized. In addition to boat folds, in addition to boat filled suffering, sea pirates attacked. They raped, killed, and tossed people to feed the sea. Many refugee camps were filled with innumerable people. Their accumulated tears flowed like rivers. They cried for their country and those who died by the sea. A million people mourned by their expatriation. With mountain-high sadness, they marched forward together. They worked very hard to build their lives over. They carried with them their own fates and their nation's fate. They raised high their burning torches of freedom. Sometime in the past, as boat people, they escaped. Their possessions filled their handbags or knapsacks. Their determination brought them shining paths. The parents built their lives. Their children succeeded. Forty years have passed, and I'm looking back in reflection. Like a passing cloud, one half of a man's life has passed. Thank you, human race. Thank you for your human love. Vietnamese people are welcomed citizens of the world. Um, I would like to introduce at this time um, the most precious person in the world to me, my wife, Annie Nguyen, if she would please just stand for recognition. My father's poem referenced his daughter's, daughter-in-law's um, 13 attempts to escape. Um, as one of the boat people. And of course, in the U.S., typically the, luck, the th number 13 is not considered a lucky number, but for my wife and her mother, um, they consider 13 very lucky. In 1990, our president at the time had an amazing uh, State of the Union. He closed it by saying, when it comes to hope and the future, every kid is the same, full of dreams, ready to take on the world, all special because they are the very future of freedom, and to them belongs this new world. And to the children and young people out there, with you rests our hope, all that a miracle will mean in the years and decades ahead. Fix your vision on a new century, your century, on dreams we cannot see, on the destiny that is yours, and yours alone. 1990, that very same year, Annie was in her journey 
to freedom. I asked, I asked Danny, um, well, why? Why come over to, to the U.S.? And um, her father, whom she had been able to escape 10 years before, and she wanted to know her father. And it's that fixing a vision of a young child who started at age seven, tried 13 times, made it at age 13. And some of the attempts uh, included where when they would get caught, uh, there's kind of like escalating, you know, I guess kind of going from a misdemeanor up to a felony. You know? um, but at first they, they would uh, kind of, you know, uh, keep Annie and, and her, her mother in for a short time in a, in a camp. Um, but every time you get caught, it would get worse and worse. And one time, um, uh, they, they were caught and then attempted to escape. Um, they had an ally who was in the village who was uh, willing to help them escape. But then uh, the soldiers started looking for them. And this young child and her mother were basically on along the side of the road or uh, uh, just in the, in, the, in the underbrush to and lying completely still because the soldiers were walking by them. And if they made a noise, um, they would be done for. Finally, um, among their attempts, they were able to make it on a boat. Uh, they landed in, um, actually, I'm sorry, b before getting on the boat, there were all kinds of terrain. You know, where we know from the beautiful pictures, uh, Vietnam has the beautiful rice paddies and, and that kind of vegetation. But when it's out of season, the terrain can be hard and cracked like that. And there were times during the escape when without any shoes, working completely in the dark, you can't have any light because you'd give your position away. Um, you'd be walking through that terrain to try to, to get to freedom. So finally, um, they made it on the boat and um, uh, I believe it was for a few, few days that they were, they were on the ocean. And uh, I remember uh, that, that she would share that parts of the ocean were so, so, so dark and deep that it, it was just seemed like an endless uh, blackness. And there was one time in terms of the horrors of this, um, they were stopped by fishermen who saw an opportunity. Um, and um, when that opportunity uh, from that perspective was, was, was done, they had, to, they had to carry the women back to the boat because they couldn't walk. Um, but, uh, my wife, uh, uh survived and, uh, made it over to the United States, uh, reunited with, with her father and, uh, their family grew in the Fredericksburg, uh, uh, Virginia area. And one of the coolest things about this, this story is that when she was finally able to go from Malaysia over to the States, they had a, a, a stopover in Hawaii. And I said, wow, Hawaii, that must have been nice. She said, it was, but it wasn't what I expected. I said, beaches, the sunsets. So what was it? Fried chicken. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, I never, look, I came from Vietnam. I, didn't, I never had fried chicken, American style, but it was the most delicious meal I ever had in my life. <laughs> so... So for a, a girl who was at 13 at that, uh, you know, 10, 13 at that time, um, I'll never look at fried chicken the same. <laughs> but for a girl that age, that, that was what freedom um, tasted like. I'd like to move to a, to a theme, of, uh, theme of service. A couple of quotes from Viktor Frankl, very famous um, and rightfully so uh, known for his, his work, and especially the book Man's Search for meaning. Ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather must recognize that it is he who is asked. In a word, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. So here I am about, you know, well, I turned 50 last year, and I've never fought in a war. Um, never had to uh, escape as an adult 
um, the type of persecution that my parents did. I never had to endure the, um, the trials that my wife did uh, when she was a, a young girl. And there have been many times when I've asked, well, what is the meaning of life? Um, what's the meaning of my life? And for me, uh, being in public service, um, having the gift of, of a family, having the gift of life itself, I realized that rather than seeking the meaning of life for oneself, service can be about what meaning can I give to the lives of those around me? And that's been just, that's made all the difference for me. I think of my parents who at one time were young parents. Um, 50 years later, they're still parents, but grandparents. I think of the faith that they had um, and the opportunity that I have just to be alive in this country is a way to fulfill that, that faith. My wife's courage, unimaginable. Um, our youngest is, is 11, so right around that age, you know, making that kind of journey in search of a family, in search of freedom. And I feel so blessed, not, that, not just that Annie is my wife, but that I get to be her husband and I get to be the father of, of our children and to do my best to give meaning to their lives in that role. So in closing, hey, we sing about this for a reason. It really is about love. Um, what I've had the privilege of sharing you, with you today, you know, some stories about friendship, faith, courage, service. They're really expressions of love. Another quote from Viktor Frankl, for the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is. I, for the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers, the truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. And I'm just so privileged to be uh, with all of you today, serving in, in public service, um, in community service, uh, as members of our community and, and our nation. I would like to um, ask to, to join me on the stage uh, some young people. Our oldest daughter, Evelyn, she'll be joining me on harp. She's a, a graduating senior. Our daughter, Estella, she'll be a rising junior <laughs> on violin, on first violin, Eliana on second violin, and our Little, cello, little fellow with his cello, Evan, rising sixth grader. By the way, um, you know, Annie is much more capable of uh, telling her story that, than I am. And, and uh, you may ask, well, why isn't Annie giving this presentation? You know, in relationships, they say opposites attract. And uh, I would say my wife is, uh, reminds me of the phrase, still waters run deep. If opposites attract, that makes me the babbling brook. <laughs> and uh, thanks to this presentation, when my son asks me, what's a metaphor? I will say, son, it's to explain marriage. <laughs> so um, I'd like to close with just a, a share from our hearts with one of the, the most beautiful songs, America the Beautiful, uh, particularly in the last verse, it would just be incredible if, if you would join us as well in song. <clears throat> 
Beautiful for heroes come in liberating strong who more than self their country love and mercy more than life America America May God thy cold refine Till all success be nobleness And every gain divine O beautiful for patriot dream That sees beyond the years Thine alabaster cities gleam Undimmed by human tears America, America God mend thine every throng Confirm thy soul in self-control I liberty in love. And what? Oh, beautiful, auspicious skies, for amber waves of green, for purple mountain majesties, and of the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on me and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you, Chief Performance Officer Nguyen, for that very inspiring address and for the rest of the family for that wonderful performance. Such a talented and musically gifted family. Let's give another round of applause to Mr. Nguyen and his family. May Heritage Month. I'm Maria Chalo de Venecia, an economist at PDNR and a board member of the HUD AANHPI Employee Resource Group. For our next guest, we would like to welcome the Japan Karate Association Club of the George Washington University to showcase their artistry and discipline of the martial arts. Here with us today to give a demonstration are several members of the club and their sensei, Paul Linehan. Mr. Linehan has recently retired from the Pentagon after 35 years of federal service. He instructs the Karate Club under the direction of Sensei Kenichi Haramoto. 
Let's give a warm applause as we welcome Mr. Lenny Han and the members of the George Washington University Karate Club. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come here today and our club is going to give a demonstration. But before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm half Japanese. Uh, I spent my life growing up in the United States. I spent a significant, uh, uh, about 15 years in Japan altogether. Um, I retired from the Pentagon after 35 years. I spent a career focused on uh, Indo-Pacific uh, security issues. And I was also a Mansfield fellow. So Ambassador Mike Mansfield had a fellowship program of federal employees that work inside the government of Japan. So I had that opportunity as well. Um, I came to Washington, D.C. and um, Sensei Kenichi Haramoto, who was um, our uh, chief instructor, and he was uh, teaching at Stanford University. His wife is teaching law at George Washington University, and that's where he started the club here in Washington, D.C. at 2002. So um, we can tell you that our club is uh, really focused on a lot of uh, really traditional Japanese martial arts. So we talk about uh, the meaning of what we call bumbu ryodo, which is uh, martial arts in uh, scholarship, so focus on academic studies. So I can tell you that the students that we have here, they're outstanding. I mean, they range from freshman undergrads all the way to PhD students. We have a student here today. She's getting her PhD. As soon as we finish here, she's going to go go and get her frock. So we appreciate her dedication. But what I'd like to do is um, just kind of tell you how we train three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour and a half. And we have members of the George Washington community join us. Uh, we have about 50 members all together. And I'll tell you is that 40% of our members are of Asian descent, and then the other 65% are women. So today, joining us today are all of our strongest and toughest karateka here, okay? And it's no surprise they're all women. So we're very proud of that fact, okay? Um, so what we'll do is we'll just do a quick demonstration. I'll have everybody line up because karate always begins and ends with a bow. So I'll ask everybody if you line up here first, we'll face the front, this is showmen. And we'll do it standing up. Sometimes we do it seiza, which is kneeling down. So it says, show me the day. The chara. The guy need day. Okay, so we'll begin a demonstration. And today what we'll do is there are three elements of karate. So there's kihon, which are basics. We're going to start with that. Then there's kata, which is a form. Then the last one is kumite. But what we focus on is really about self-defense. As you know, during covid there was a wave, an increase of uh, anti-Asian uh, random attacks, right? And so one of the things that we really tell our students is that this is focused on self-defense. We're not about winning trophies or going to tournaments. And we do that on occasion, but we're primarily focused about instilling confidence and then safety and security by being able to defend yourself. So what we'll do here today is uh, let's line up uh, facing this way. And we'll start with some kihon, so maybe you can get some space. And then we'll back it up a little bit here, back it up. Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, issue the command. So all the commands we do are all in Japanese. Um, so we'll just uh, begin. So, um, so, muzubidachi. And they. Yoi. Hidari genambarai kamaite. Okay, so oizuki jodan. Three times. Ich. Ni. Sun. Okay, stepping back. Ageyuke kizami mai geri gyakuzuki. Itch. Ni. Sun. Gedambarai. Kick. Oizuki chuda. Itch. Ni. Sun. Okay, stepping back. Okay. Uchiuke kokutsudachi. Kizami. Yakuzuki. Itch. Ni. Sun. Okay, Gidambarai Kamaite. All right, so now we're going to step forward. Soto ke MP Uraken Yakuzuki. Three times. Itch. 
，你新。Hey, same thing going back. Itch. Hey, sun. Hey, yummy. Hey, now, Ray. Okay. Okay. So for the for the next set, we're gonna do hokutsudachi shitoke kizami mai geri nukite. Okay. Ready? Left leg forward. Shitoke kamaite. A stepping forward, a itch. A sun. A same thing back. Itch. A sun. A yummy. Hey, now Ray. Okay, so my giri. Okay, we're gonna get on, but I come out there. Okay, so rengeri, chudan geri, and then mai geri, jodan. Hey, itch. Hey. Sun. Hey, mawate, turn. Hey, same thing going forward. Itch. Hey. Sun. Hey, mawate, turn. Okay, stepping forward, we're going to do... Uh, Mai geri oizuki. So, mai geri oizuki gyakuzuki. Okay? Hey, come on. Hey, itch. Ni. Sun. Hey, mawate turn. Hey, same thing going back. Itch. Hey. Sun. Hey, mawate turn. Hey, yame. Hey, now, Ray. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so now we're going to do the yoko keage. Okay, so facing this way, we're going to do left side. Okay, hidari, kibadachi, kokuzudachi, kamaite. Okay, hands up, kamai, facing target. Okay, so now you're going to do keage, uraken, gyakuzuki across the body. Itch. Ni. Sun. Hey, mawate turn. Hey, same going back. Itch. Ni. Sun. Hey, mawate turn. Hey, yame. Hey, now, re. Okay, so now we're going to do Gidambara. We're going to do the Kekomi, right? Kekomi, uraken, gyakuzuki. Okay, three times. Hey, get on my Get your hands up, kamai. Hey. Sun. Mawate turn. Hey, wait. Itch. Hey. Sun. Hey, mawate turn. Hey, yame. Hey, now, Ray. Okay, so that's the end of basics. So usually what we do is we have the beginning of the class focused on basics like this. Okay, and this gives the opportunity for people to warm up and then we'll go into the next part, which is going to be the kata. Okay, so this is when we do forms. So for the kata, why don't we have two sets? So you guys are going to do hand yonda, so you can go up to the front and then you do hand goda at the same time, okay, instead of do separate, okay? So you t you guys, Tiaren, right? Alexis, do hand yonda, hand goda, all right? And then we'll get you guys basai dai, okay? So, muzumi dachi, rei, te yo. Okay, announce kata and begin anytime. Hajime. Hey, yummy.
Hey, now, Ray. Oh, very good. Nice job. Very nice. Oh, yes. Off to the side. Okay. Oh, okay, so this is going to be a black belt kata now. Okay, this is called Basai Dai. Okay, and this means storming the castle. Okay? So, Chomini Dei. Announce kata. They start anytime. Hajime. Thank you very much. Oh, very nice. A shell. So, so the other the other part that we do is called kumite, which is controlled sparring but what we want to do is show the application of some of the the techniques so why don't you all come up and then uh get it get a spot right and then uh so yeah all together i think would be okay all right okay so you're gonna face each other how okay face each other so face face this way yeah okay and then stagger maybe come up here you guys come up here and then get away from the stage a little bit. So they're going to do uh, an application of the controlled sparring. All right. So face each other. What the guy need? They. Okay. So whoever's going to attack first, I'll just say Hajime. And then you do your routine. So Hajime. Yummy. Okay. Okay. Face audience. Stand up. Okay. So we'll we'll stop here, and then uh, I think that'll be okay. But if anyone has any questions, so everyone move up. So we're gonna bow showmen first. It's okay. Okay, Mizubi, that showmeni. Turn them off. Face on it. What the guy need? Hey, boss. Thank you very much, boss. Thank you. Okay, we're all set. This. Thank you uh, for that wonderful demonstration. Um, another round of applause, please, uh, for our guests. All right, I know we're running a couple minutes late, so I'll keep this brief. I want to respect everyone's time. I just have a couple announcements before we close. Um, if you're interested, uh, there are more May Heritage Month events. Um, our partners over at the Department of Interior are running a, a Hawaiian Sailing Wayfinder event on May 29th. Um, check for your email and on our team's page for that information. Um, I also want to announce that if you'd like to, are you interested in these kinds of events or you want to help um, uh with uh, with these sort of events in the future, or we'll have ideas for uh, the employee resource group, uh, please consider nominating someone you know or yourself for our board. Board elections are open 
until next Friday. Uh, you can email Han, who has been sending out all these lovely invitations, or our general email, HUD, A-A-N-H-P-I-E-R-G, like employee resource group, at HUD.gov. Uh, and to close, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank my board. Um, and uh, I'll share a little bit of uh, cultural history for myself. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but my last name, Zai, actually is means thanks uh, in Chinese. Uh, my family is from Hong Kong. Um, and so in Cantonese, uh, de, like do de, ge de, is my last name. So I'll end this program with saying do de, thank you everyone for coming. As we say, Hawaii, mahali, mahalo, nui, loha. Uh, thank you very much for coming and have a happy May Heritage Month.